my name is Erin Renier, and I'm the professor of cello here at Washburn University, Department of Music and Theater. And I'm here to help you cellos out today, go through these uh, wonderful Allstate Orchestra and District excerpts. So the first one we're starting off with is the Felix Mendelssohn Hebrides Overture, Fingal's Cave. Uh, it's a wonderful overture that Mendelssohn emulates the sounds of waves crashing into rocks and lapping against each other. And we're supposed to kind of emulate that when we're playing all these wonderful string crossings without the audience sounding like they're getting seasick. So most important thing is to work on bow control. We're gonna work on that challenge right now with a couple technique tricks. Um, if you look at the PDF down below, you can get some suggested fingerings. I do a lot of second position and some half position. And then down on the fourth line, I do something kind of interesting. Some people that have large hands, it works really well for you to play that D, A, F sharp, A really well. But for us smaller handed people, I actually do what I call three and a half position. I shift on the D and then I go over to the four on the C string and play the A and then the F sharp and the A, something like this. Then I come back. So that way I can get that in tune because those darn four fingers never get that F sharp high enough. And so that's just an alternative uh, style. So you don't have to do it, but just a suggestion. Here are some things that I want you to think about when you're working on this piece. You really want to work on wor working your torso and approaching changing the strings in a, a manner that you're going out and in with your bow versus up and down. You will save a lot of bow speed that way and not run out of bow. That's one of the big challenges with line three with those 16th notes and then the crescendo, decrescendo at the end. So make sure that you really work on working at cylindrically. So let, let me show you an example. I'll do this under tempo. See how much I'm turning my torso as I play? That helps me save bow. The other thing that you wanna work on is what I call the double stop effect. You add you add a note, but you don't actually leave the string you just came from. So for instance, if I'm already on the D string, I'm gonna add the G string like this. I'm not necessarily gonna play those independently. What that does is it allows me to bounce back quicker uh, and rebound when I play. The other thing you wanna make sure of is when you're tracking your bow, that you keep intensifying the rotation of your shoulder to push the bow into the string because as you wander to the upper half, you start losing that pressure and then you have to make up for it with what we call um, lateral movement or more, more bow and we just don't have the room for it. So as you enter the upper half of the bow, make sure that you're rotating in, pressing that string. That really, really helps on the end of the down bows with the 16th notes on those long passages, okay? One more thing, evenness is of key here. So uh, when you're playing the rhythm, you wanna go th through all of the different tempo variables. Set your metronome to eighth note equals 160, and then, then go up from there to 180. Once you hit that, go into quarter note equals 90. Getting the exact speed, the tempo indicator, which says quarter note equals 96 equals 100, that's not nearly as important as being close to the tempo and representing what Mendelssohn wanted in terms of energy. So take your time with it, work your, your, your notch it up with, with the metronome. It really, really works well. I'm gonna show you an example of this. I'm gonna start with my metronome a little lower here. I'm gonna start at maybe probably around, oh, let's, let's try the 160. Here we go, let me find that real quick. Here we are. So this right here is hearing eighth note. So I'm gonna try that first passage, just one eighth note at a time. So there we have that. And then what we do is we just keep increasing faster and faster and faster and faster. So like this. Then eventually, once you get to the 180, then you'd go down to 90, which would be your quarter note beat. And you feel it in quarter. What this allows you to do is fill out those quarter notes, because one of the tendencies people have is they tend to rush those quarter notes at that opening theme. 
and then everything gets just progressively a little bit faster. And then by the time you get to the third line, it's too fast and can't control it. So work on that. Another suggestion, second line, last measure, push your bow to make sure you're at the frog to be prepared for that third line because that can get a little tricky. So anyway, that's a little bit uh, of help of, with the he Hebrides and um, good luck with it. Here we are with Franz Soupé's Poet and Peasant Overture. This is a lovely solo feature for someone who's lucky enough to lead the section, but we have it as an excerpt for us for, for district orchestra auditions. So I have suggested some fingerings. These are, of course, just suggestions. Use the advice of your private teacher, or if you don't have a private teacher, hopefully this might help you a bit. Um, in the recording, I do my own fingerings that are not necessarily what you might choose. Um, but I've given some suggestions, some things that are a little bit simpler because of the, the high register and, and not being in tenor clef. I will give you some advice for my small-handed friends. Um, when you're doing the triplets in measure four and also the third line first measure, it's a tricky thing to try to reach up to an A from the F sharp. So my suggestion, if you really are struggling with it and being able to get back down to the G natural and having all three of those notes in tune, I would suggest instead play a four. Um, I know that seems unusual up here in the upper range, but it really works well. You play a, an F sharp for the, on the one and play a four on the A and a two on the G. So I'll show you an example of that. Let's see here. So one, rotate. Two. So in, in context, here it is. So that works kind of well for us small-handed people. Um, and then, you know, those that don't have to do it, you don't have to do it. So that's one suggestion I have. Um, one of the biggest points, I think, that from a judging perspective, that I've uh, thought of when I've listened to students play this is the propensity to rush. Um, there's a lot of rhythmic variables with this piece. And so we have to really make sure that we fill out our half notes, our ties, and not subdividing in quarter notes, subdivide in eighths. It really helps. Um, when I prepared this piece, I actually put myself on a metronome at 132 for eighth note. It not only helped me with my sustained tones, but it also helped me with my dotted eighth and sixteenth relationships. And I was pleasantly surprised at how, how much I clipped and not realized it. So uh, word to the wise, it really, really helps. And then of course you can take off the metronome when you're in uh, the Rolantando measure, which is the second line, first measure, and also the ca cadenza on the last line. Um, other pieces of advice on this, have fun with it, it's beautiful, it's a time to show off your vibrato and um, just make sure that you're being succinct with your rhythm and um, with your half notes and your dotted half notes, okay? All right. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, the last excerpt that we have in our selection this year is the Mozart Symphony Number no. 4 first movement excerpt. And, you know, Mozart wasn't a big fan of the cello. And, you know, this type of writing, everybody has it in the string section, but man, it's a stinker for us cellists to play. So we uh, do our best with trying to create that spiccato uh, to match up with our upper strings friends. And so my suggestion for you is not to feel like you have to go at the tempo that's written. Get close to it and you will um, you'll represent the energy just fine. Accuracy is key. Play around with the dynamic. In the PDF below, you'll see also not just fingering suggestions, but some accent suggestions. Accenting went through the series of eighth notes. It's better not to overemphasize the down bow, but actually accent from the second note of the set of four. It helps kind of push you from behind and keep you more on your toes than on your heels. So for instance, that I'll play a little example of the third line last measure. And I'm going to do it slow so you can see what I mean by emphasis. Now that was under tempo, but it really, really works when you go fast. Um, and, and the more you exaggerate that dynamic level with, with uh, accents, the, the better off you'll be. Um, some other thoughts that I have for you, again, is metronome. In time and in tune is the most thing when it comes to preparing for excerpts, and this is no exception. I also want to uh, give you a technique idea. Try not to be so forearm-oriented when you're doing your bow stroke. Instead, use more of the finger grasp and release technique. It will help push the bow into the string, and the, the string will respond in a quicker manner. A lot of times, we tend to use too much of our forearm, and then we make our fingers very passive, and, and as a result, what happens is we can't seem to get to that next level of speed. Remember, it's all about physics. The, the string is resisting what the bow is doing to it. So think of it like dribbling a basketball. The more you push into the string, the, the quicker it's gonna respond back. So lateral movement is not as important as vertical movement, and that will help you get a, a faster when you're playing it. Um, as I said before, evenness and speed are not important. Good old fashioned way to practice it, start from the bottom with your metronome as slow and as boring as possible to where you're memorizing the notes. And that's another great uh, way to practice it is to, to not look at the music, start learning to memorize the patterns. And then by the time you get close to the tempo, you should probably not need the music because you've drilled it so much. It's just good old fashioned drill work. So good luck. Well, I hope this was helpful today. Um, the goal behind this is to help everyone get closer to feeling comfortable with playing in front of judges. It's not an easy thing, but once you start doing it, it becomes less uncomfortable. And I wanted to give you some tools to help you achieve that. So again, my name is Erin Renier, and I'm the professor of cello here at Washburn University. If you're interested in coming and visiting, uh, I would love to hear from you. You can see my contact information with this YouTube video, and I'd be more than happy to set up a, a free lesson and give you a tour, and you can come check out the Washburn Cellos. Have a great day.